Before we start the talk, a little brief about this venture. Lime Green Visual Arts Space is excited to present a series of talks titled as the Lime Green Journal that tells stories of creative journey, cultural and conceptual exchange and artistic cross fertilization, where we converse and explore the fascinating minds of creative people. We hope to inspire curiosity, ignite your imagination and provoke new ways oh, of thinking speaking. about the world. For this feature, our guest is Fasi Zaka, who has established himself as an indisputable icon for many of us. He works in the media in Pakistan. He has hosted television and radio shows while also being a regular on national news. He was a Rhodes Scholar to Oxford University and WEF Young Global Leader for his work in public policy and the media. He is also known as a satirist with many works in TV, radio, and print. Zaka headlines one of Pakistan's most listened to radio shows, the Fussy Zaka and Friends shows, on Pakistan's FM radio station, Radio 1 FM 91, known for its creative and absurdist humor and liberal politics. He is from Charsada in KP. Fussy, thank you for trusting in this venture, gracing us with your time and space. It's monumental for us. Well, thank you so much. I'm really grateful as well. This brings me to the first question. Do you remember the first time you were amused by your own creative skills or when you realized that you could do something creatively? I think it was in um, school, actually. And I think um, I think one of our teachers was making some kind of comment and I made a joke and uh, so it had everyone laughing. And I think that was sort of a bit of a drug for the first time ever, you know, having everyone laugh at something you've said. And I also remember early on in my life, I was just reading, I, I used to read a lot as a kid and it was uh, a letter to the editor in the Frontier Post. And um, they were talking about oil being thicker than blood and that it was more prized. And I just thought that phrase was really interesting. And then I sat down to write a really terrible poem about it. And, uh, but it was just interesting because I think for me, just, uh, I remember these things because they each sort of reflected something that I hadn't really thought about before because a lot of things were very standard and all that. And they not necessarily were great in any way, but um, I, I, I do remember them to this day. And so what feelings guided your process back then? Was it the reaction or the responses you received from the from the class setting or the people who laughed at the joke? So I think it was two things. I think one was that uh, my mother was very strict and uh, she loved the idea of reading. So she would uh, we, 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 she wouldn't buy us many things, but uh, we had in if we wanted a book or a magazine or a comic book, she didn't discriminate in terms of what we read. She would go and buy that for us. And because I didn't get to go out that much, I used to spend a lot of time reading. And then later in my life, I also learned that reading too early tends to isolate you in some way from everyone else because you should do age-appropriate things. Yes. And then that, become, that helps uh, inadvertently make you more lonely. But what it also does is it makes you an observer because you're not really part of anything. And that observer status sometimes helps you look at contradictions, look at other things, and it gives you a vantage point as not being a joiner, but as somebody who's just looking at this and wondering, what does it stand for? So I think that detachment in some ways uh, led me to have an enjoyment of contradiction mm -hmm. in terms of what people said and what people did. I think it also gave me an interest in representation, who gets to say what, um, then class differences always fascinated me. I think the shower had that element of growing up there because a lot of us were Tommies. We liked, you know, modern music, all that, but we still liked our culture. The culture was very, uh, in some ways, anti-materialistic. You became... were always sort of oscillating between concealing or revealing whatever you gained from the information. Yeah, I... yeah, yeah. And, and... And, and I, I, I don't know when it happened, but I think very early in my life, I loved absurdity. Anything that sort of, because 
it was a very, in some ways, ossified class structure as well. And then anything that's totally absurd is breaking everything, right? It's uh, having no rules. Pakistan is a magnificent country to discover ab absurdity, right? There's so much absurdity in everyday life. Yeah. There are a lot of people who are fundamentally so interesting simply because they haven't understood. That's something that, you know, I found that really influenced me quite a bit. And it's any post or anything. Online. I'm always trying to find vignettes of real life where things are just ridiculous. And uh, it's something I've always enjoyed. And so you said that, you know, you you uh, think of yourself as an observer. Observation and observing something is always a very core ingredient in understanding the creative process. So when you when you become an observer, I think then the, the next step is to muster up the courage to voice out your opinion, to let that observation out verbally. So when did you must when and how did you muster up that courage and confidence to just unleash that up, absurd uh, opinions that you thought about or you created in your mind out in the public, either in the personal setting, family setting, amongst your friends, and later on in the media? So I think um, uh, one was uh, what I remember is when I was in my BA in Edwards College, my whole life I've been very introverted and I've feared public speaking uh, before that. Oh. And it was in my English class with, uh, we had a professor, he's passed away, unfortunately, Alabak Sajid. And uh, he had sort of noticed that I was scribbling something and I had written a poem. And then he asked me to read it in front of the class. And always like whether they just thought, okay, as you know, when I was in school, he must be a great speaker. And I was terrible. And each time they put me up, it was like, huge amounts of embarrassment because I would fail later. I didn't want to join. But that was the first time in my life that I read something that I believed in and sort of my voice resonated in the classroom. I could modulate because it was something I knew intimately and something I felt. And I mean, it sounds like hyperbole, but from that day on, I never feared public speaking after that. It was a transformation. Um, and uh, so I think, I mean, it, it, it was... That, the other one was also is that I was uh, very lucky uh, in the sense that my cousin Zishan Parvez, who's, uh, you know, he's a really gifted filmmaker. Yes. And he and I lived a street away and we both found the same things funny. We both found the same things interesting. And we had this opportunity to talk, uh, to joke around. Um, and I think that really helped. I had another friend, Tainu Salim also, and we used to, sit together and so a lot of I think the things is that one is sort of reading where you get to be intimately familiar with somebody's ideas or somebody's recollections or their art but at the same time I think the process of being able to sort of talk to somebody else talk to somebody else and understand how they've looked at it differently and when you find points of commonality which which is why I find fandom so interesting mm -hmm. is that it creates this huge appreciation for art because not only is it about what you feel uh, receiving something, but it's incredibly important to connect to others who have the same elicitation of feeling because it creates this connection, which is just amazing. I think the sense of familiarity that you need to need for the other people, the other person to also grow within themselves. And that's by communicating your ideas with them. And that's also by disclosing what your creative process is like. So I would like to ask you what your creative process was like and is like. Is there a certain methodology that you've been following? Is there a set ritual that you follow? What is it? Do you read something, then you archive it down and then you process? What is it like? So mine is uh, what I'd call diligent vela fun. <laughs> and what I mean by that is like, I really do We endorse that intensity. as well. It's so relevant for us. Yes. I mean, uh, so digital available, uh, diligent available is really important because 
usually what I do is uh, anything I have to do, like I do a lot of intense reading, I think about it, and then I forget about it. Um, and then, you know, I do two, three days of wasting my time, <laughs> and suddenly it comes to you. Uh, yes. It sort of manifests itself. The background, the subconscious is doing something or the other. Um, I used to remember we used to do a program uh, for Indus Music in the MTV. It was called On the Fringe. Mm -hmm. And we used to do, you know, uh, my cousin, uh, we would do interviews of music. We'd do a lot of, um, you know, reviews and little bits in between as well. And I remember one time, like he was telling me, like, you were just horrendous to work with. Because you're talking about, uh, you know, how to uh, get something out. And what it would be is like, he'd be like, write the script. We have to shoot next week. And I'd like, okay, get me some popcorn. So he'd have to go and get me some popcorn. Then I'd say to him, I said, nothing. I said, get me some cigarettes. And I'd treat him like, you know, my errand boy for a full day. And I said, no, I'm coming back tomorrow. Then I'd come back tomorrow. Then I'd have ideas. Then I'd write everything. And he tolerated it. And then he would, you know, uh, he's extremely gifted. He would add all these things. And then we'd look at something. I mean, I remember when I talk about uh, sort of, you know, sort of being an outsider. So I have a lot of intellectual interests, but sometimes I find the high-minded nature of intellectuals a bit difficult to deal with because it's sometimes too serious. And we used to have this one component of that show on the fringe, which was called the Intellectual Film of the Week. And we would do a one-minute parody, but most people didn't realize. We'd pretend that people were submitting these to us. And eventually people started writing to us that they wanted to submit their film. So and well, one of our favorite ones was that I actually got Zishan and it was a really um, unusual position. I put him, he was wearing his kameesh he was lying on the bed and I asked him to raise both legs up. And when he raised both legs up, we were filming it and then I threw a paper airplane and it went through between his legs and then both the legs came down. And so our point was that, you know, this film is just like an extremely cheap representation of an allegory of September 11 and the Twin Towers. <laughs> and, you know, people think it was actually a very serious thing that we were talking about. And then uh, we'd go forward. In fact, again, on the thing with the outsider element is that when we did that program, one of the things that we always tell uh, anyone we interviewed is interview And what we wanted was to get the stars to be a bit arrogant with us. And before, and then we'd lay into them, you know, the jokes or some of the issues that we'd raise and things like that. And um, so, I mean, I think for uh, the longest time, I mean, I, I think that outside element, uh, which I find harder to do now was something really interesting because uh, at one level, when we finished the program, one of the reasons we finished is that everyone got wise to the game. That this is not just like two random dudes showing up for an interview. Uh, and all that. Um, but I, I, I think to add one other part to you, I think is that fundamentally in the creative process, other than writing, uh, because I've done a lot of serious stuff for op-eds for the newspapers. I've done that for years. Uh, that's analysis. That's uh, your sort of siloed intellectual interests uh, on policy and things like that, or politics. But everything else that I've done that I've really enjoyed has always been a collaboration. So whether it's Zishan in radio, I've had tons of collaborators. There are these people who I find immensely funny. And I find that sometimes I can only create material by bouncing it off them. And um, similarly, uh, stuff for television. And the thing that I think has always been part and parcel of it is trust. Um, because in the creative process, you come up with huge duds as well. Yes. Like sometimes you, you and, and, and if you're going to work in a collaborative environment, it is really important that uh, your collaborator has the sensitivity and, and uh, also respect for you yes. to pretend he didn't hear what you just said, right? Mm -hmm. It was Tige. Maybe this doesn't work. Let's move on and all that. Because Usme, I mean, I, I, I've seen very intensely competitive collaborative environments. Uh, and the toxicity is one thing, but the other thing is that the net result is always terrible. And so even when you look at uh, incredible, uh, you know, bands or directors like we've got this thing with 
duos like the Russo brothers, others, while I wouldn't call it high art, but the fact that that collaboration is creating things is incredibly interesting. That's wonderful. And also another thing, like how do you judge or how do you analyze that if the person or the collaborator you're working with or opted to work with is worth it? Because there's certain collaborations where you're not aware of their true nature, of their insecurities, of the yeah. uh, lack of trust that is in that collaboration. How do you deal with that? So I think that's incredibly difficult. I think the only collaborator that I've gone into my life totally cold with is uh, George Fulton. When we did a program called News, Views and Confused. Mm -hmm. At Arch TV? incredibly lucky. But, mm -hmm. Yes, on Arch TV. Okay. I was incredibly lucky because uh, I remember I had read a profile of his before and that profile sort of set him up as a public school boy, as maybe a closet Tory, things like that. And I was like very defensive. I wasn't sure. And I, the warmth I saw immediately and like within weeks uh, to this day, we're incredibly close friends. Um, and so that's it. But everything else, like, I mean, with my cousin, uh, all my people on radio, they've all been my friends. They've mm. all been people that has effectively translated things that we do on a, my closest friends uh, from my BA, uh, one is a guy called uh, Ani, Simran, and Mohammed. To this day, like we have a WhatsApp group every day and every day we talk on it and it's almost adolescent, uh, you know, uh, singing the old times. Uh, well, we, actually, it's perpetual adolescence. Like, you haven't grown up. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes, like, you know, we have jokes that, that we then put out and all that. Um, but I've often found is that um, a little bit of friendship, like, really helps. Like, again, on the Aj uh, program, like, one of my other close friends who I've actually been very influenced by in my early thinking when I used to do reading is mm -hmm. Nadim Farooq Paraj. And then he's, having he's phenomenal. That, he's phenomenal. So I mean, I mean, I think he is brilliant. And then to have him as a friend, because we realized that we also um, relate on uh, a number of uh, issues just personally as well. And um, so that that was also like having that friendship is a privilege. But again, like in terms of, I remember being very interested in vital signs and genome and all that. Every week I would read about what Nadim was writing and trying to explain that this has some larger meaning. This has some larger consequence or, um, and then looking at some of his satirical bits because a lot of it was, you know, very standard about what nationalism is, what our identity is. You've got somebody who's poking holes into it. And it was just like an, ed an education in some ways. Like you take what you believe in. And then in some ways, I found that critique would make it stronger. It would make it more nuanced. And you could also reject parts of it. Um, so I, I think in terms of my own collaborations, it's been very rare in my life that, you know, I've sought out somebody that I want to do something with you without being... Uh, friends first and that process of friendship is almost accidental. You meet mm -hmm. them somewhere, you start talking about something and something really interests you. I mean, I, I met uh, somebody recently, Nadir Shahzad, who's also really interesting and we had uh, dinner. Uh, then we were just talking and like one of the things that I've often wanted to do in my life is write a film, like 90 minutes and but the rule of the film would be is that we'd get people we knew, whether mm -hmm. they knew or didn't know acting, they would get the script an hour before and then just make a purposely bad movie with a really good script, right? You know, somebody just shows up in the room, that your mother died. And the guy says, my mother died, and the guy says, right? And, and the whole film should be dead banned just like that, like get it irritating and all that. And it's something only when you talk to somebody that you think that certain ideas are possible or that they're interesting. Um, so at least with me, it's mostly like that. Mm -hmm. And so how do you describe the core concern of your creative work? 
Um, has it has it been different in today's day and time than before? So I, yeah. So so I, I'll tell you. Okay. So the core concern is, uh, in some ways, a reflection of things that I intellectually believe in. Right. I really believe in representation. I believe in democracy. I also don't believe in majoritarianism. That yes. too many people believe one thing is we not sufficient. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, and then uh, um, a degree of equality, and but so what's changed is that what I felt increasingly is that up to the two thousands. You know, it was very easy for you, maybe as a satirist, to see who the enemy was. That these are the people or these are the groups that have kept entrenched positions and don't allow for society to progress or keep people down. What's happened, uh, partly, I think, after September 11, one of the big things was that, you know, new bogeymans were created, but especially after the rise of the internet, where ironically, the thing that, you know, I used to believe in most is that everyone should have a voice. Yes. You've gone towards demagoguery. And the difficulty of satire now is, is before, you know, if you were talking about a minister or a party or the army, you were always punching up to somebody more powerful than you. The problem right now is that now, the issue in some ways has become the masses. And these masses sometimes believe the wrong thing, but they are also terribly unprivileged. They have disadvantages that have created these simplistic solutions where they've otherized other people and they've looked at enemies. And so the problem of satire now is that in some ways you're punching down, like, uh, you know, yes, we don't like mobs, but we wonder what kind of frustration creates a mob. And then, you know, whether to talk about it just as a moral issue or if you're also making fun of it, then you're also making fun of the kind of situation they're in. So I, I think it's become a bit more complex, but what I've often found the most interesting has, you know, is that when you look at certain ideas that you can't question, certain truths that are meant to be universal, when you use satire or art to critique it, um, I think society has become much more powerful as a result. And actually, uh, the problem with following ideas that are enforced upon you is that they'll eventually crumble in a very spectacular fashion. And allowing this degree of art to flourish is either to break it down bit by bit or to make it stronger in ways that it needs to become stronger. So, um, again. That is, for every creative person, there's a studio setting, a studio space, a little sanctuary that they create for yourself where they perform the best. All the ideas they come out, usually look at in a bathroom, is such ideas out there. I think that's, that's, that's relevant for everyone. Everyone can relate with that. But for you, over the period of your entire career, what has been the ideal studio situation, a space where you sit alone, you either meditate or you archive your ideas or you construct your ideas, deconstruct them, sort of uh, think about what you want to contribute in the creative world. So what is the studio setting like? Can you picture it for, them, for us? So I, um... I don't have a studio like most artists do or anything like that, but I do have a home office mm -hmm. and my home office has my computer, all my things that I like, my books. Um, it's got a chair that is incredibly comfortable uh, and um, I've, uh, and it's where I tend to read um, quite a bit. And I think, more than anything for me, I, I don't have a very disciplined process. So, like I've noticed, uh, people have notes apps, they have ideas and whatever. Mm -hmm. I just, in my mind, and I keep building on it, narrate it to myself. Um, so I can give you an example. Uh, one of the things that I was quite happy with that we did a couple of, which became really viral. Um, me and Zishan, we did this uh, 
series on the coronavirus for mm-hmm. uh, which is called Babo Badmash. And Babo Badmash, again, it's a telling of some of the things from our culture. But when I was thinking about it, you know, I kept thinking like, you know, what Specifically would the Pashtun culture or all yeah. cultures? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. Uh, actually, in, in one way, it is all cultures. Mm-hmm. But uh, some of the, like, the visual representation and some of the uh, terminology was definitely Pashtun. But the thing that we were looking at was... I kept thinking about, you know, what is it that would appeal? And in a way, all of us, uh, you know, there are aspects to when you are a teenager or when you're growing up, mm-hmm. there are aspects to the toxic masculinity that we do like, right? We watch Schwarzenegger films, we watch Stallone films, and, you know, we don't label it as such, but we've got that in our culture. And so, I mean, the idea, for example, for that came from that if you took the tropes of Toxic, uh, toxic masculinity, and one of the specific ones for Tabar Pakhtun Pa was that, that, you know, my gun is my weapon, my gun is the law. And so, you know, that you were this, in some ways, a Western, um, like a cowboy, that, you know, you took up arms against any injustice or anything like that. And then we said, you know, the idea then became that what if we inverted that and that instead of taking up a gun in our hands, let's just use soap to wash our hands. And then that became, you know, this whole thing that we moved forward with. So the question of like, where did that idea come from? And some of it was just like, again, Vela Pan just sitting in my bed, looking at the ceiling, some bits of the idea came, some just while working on something else. When I do have to write a script, I have usually, uh, you know, series running in the background, uh, a little bit of music playing elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And somehow all of that really helps as long as it's not another human being talking to you because that you have to pay attention to. But this really helps, um, at least for me. I, I know a lot of people require a lot of silence. I do from human beings, but you know, if other things are running, I really do like it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I mean, so I think space has something to do with it, but I think more than space is just being afforded some silence and some alone time mm-hmm. that's the great thing that you can have in uh, creativity i mean ultimately for me is because i'm sort of the ideas person or the script person uh, as i said all of its collaboration yes. and there's other uh, and then that part of course you have to engage with and if it helps that you trust them that you uh, also respect them because any idea you write is not what is finally also going to be what's there on screen or because they also ever evolving. Lot. Yeah, yeah. So in this entire process, you're known for your humor. For all the podcasts that you've done, the radio shows that you've done. I remember a large part of my uh, my early my my years, uh, they were focused and dedicated to your Fasi Zaka show radio time. And when we when I got my first mobile, it had the feature of having FM on it yes. and that used to be my time i would just plug on my headphones and i just listen to the show almost the, the the content that you guys were sharing even the laugh was contagious so this was something the, the responsibility that a creative person holds is to bring a certain kind of change in the other person's life uh, to to either make either put a smile on the other person uh, person's face or to uh, bring out the thought provoking ideas or to change the pattern of how a human mind thinks. So having said that, what convinces you that your creative contributions are going to bring a change in the ever-changing society that we live in? A society where everything is constantly changing. Like if you say something, there are 10,000 renditions of that the next day. And how do you cope up with that? How do you, how do you um, take that responsibility to us? situation where you're certain that it's going to bring a change it's going to have some questions some responses so uh two things i think one is age mm-hmm. and the second Pakistan has beat out any notions that you can do anything in that respect right that's the arrogance of youth and i i mean i had it also i thought okay we're just mm-hmm. waiting for this idea or we're just waiting for somebody to say this mm-hmm. and 
and the truth is social change is a very incremental process it's like you know uh, maybe a waterfall that's dried out with only a little drip of water falling but eventually right a pond of change is created yes and i also think that quite often that too much is put on the shoulders of a few people who become in some ways the definers of some change so like if you look at rock music there is a whole series of blues black musicians who actually created what would become to something and and i think personally i mean i'm like that also like i get, i get a lot of ideas from other people uh from things that i find interesting or i read and amalgamation is actually in some ways one of your top tier uh creative processes because it's not as creative on its own but what it is is that it is a curation process that makes it palatable and a message that people you know sort of enjoy and internalize in many ways so i think that like with the radio show the radio show for me was therapy i used to feel great after it and one of the things that i think most people maybe uh didn't realize is that yeah me my friends who were on it you know like hasan guli like dr saab like ali like tareem uh like a number of others um they all had these magnificent contributions haris amid but uh this was also a user content generated show you had people calling in we had no topic no preparation and it was anybody who called in to say anything they wanted theek hai na wo apne bombiyan maar rahe the theek hai na hum reverse pe kar rahe the and uh i found like there were so many things that i found were really interesting because it gave us opportunities so i remember one year it was 14th of feb and uh, this guy called in and we were sponsored by walls that year and usually the channel wouldn't make me do any uh, you know read the sponsored messages because i on purpose would read it in a very sarcastic manner <laughs> and then they eventually you know it didn't uh, but on that we, we were sponsored by unhone a new flavor nikala tha flirty pen theek hai na and one two others and you know and that was the only year i was enthusiastic because i thought it was kind of cool that they had a flavor called flirty berry and mujhe yaad hai ek ladke ne call ki bas ro raha tha and uh, you know, yeah, no. <laughs> ah okay was you know kisa kharab hai chhod gayi hai and was like i'm going to go kill myself and mm-hmm. we realized he was kind of serious and um, and and then that's what i used to love about the radio show is that you found all these people and you could actually we had fun we joke all the time but we could interrogate them on these things that maybe we didn't think of we you did bring out the day of cid for ourselves right <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and 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 then so we asked him ke yaar dekh you know agar khudkushi kari na hai na you have to realize ki the rate of unsuccessful khudkushi is bahut high hote hain theek hai na so we need you to explain <laughs> to bach gaye ha ke kaam tamam kar lo right so he said mai train track ke samne वो लेट जाऊंगा तो हमने फिर वही कहा कि लाइक कम से कम द हेड मस्ट बी अबव वन ऑफ द ट्रैक्स ठीक है ना वरना वो पाव शाव चले जाएगा लाइक ठीक है ना एंड वो वी वर हैविंग दैट डिस्कशन वो सीरियस था वो आखिर में वो कहते हैं कि बस मैं कर रहा हूं तो वी सेड ओके लिसन तेरा तो टाइम ओवर है भाई ठीक है ना एंड वी कन्विंस यू हमारी अपनी मजबूरी है ये दिहाड़ी लगाते हैं हम रेडियो पे मरने से पहले तू उस पैसे का क्या करेगा एक बारह फ्लटी बैरी खरीद लेगा ठीक है ना क्या उनको बता एंड एंड दैट वाज़ द टाइम ही राइट देन सॉर्ट ऑफ ओके आई आई रिमेम्बर वंस जब लाल मस्जिद का टाइम था अगेन दिस आई फाउंड रियली इंटरेस्टिंग वाज राइट आफ्टर रेडियो मुझे किसी ने कॉल कर दिया कि ये आप रेडियो uh, पे गप लगाते हैं लड़कियां भी बड़ी आजाद बातें करती हैं Uh, and actually to be honest is that the one kind of humor i don't have which i don't like is i don't like double entendres i don't make sex jokes or whatever it was no real reason but it's just something i've never really done mm-hmm. and you sometimes on radio you know uh, they don't know you they say something and we say ji ban or whatever it, because we just want it to be wo so but that guy even found that offensive so he said bas agar aapne ye ban nahi kiya na 
तो हम आपको कतल कर दिए ना दिस वॉज आई मीन यूट हाँ बट बट इट इज वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग बिकॉज आई नेवर एक्चुअली हैड द अपॉर्चुनिटी to to talk to somebody in detail it was usually wo pakistan mein to bahut hi aa jate online ki ye kar denge wo kar denge theek hai na wo pakistan mein ye hai ke jisne kuch karna hai wo aapko batata nahi hai the guy who tells you is just this online whatever so i i asked the guy said theek hai ye aapne keh diya aap mujhe bataye ki system kya hoga ke bas isi ke baad aap kuch kar rahe hain he says nahi ha he said nahi he said nahi hamara tarika hai कि हम आपको तीन वार्निंग्स देंगे फिर करेंगे तो मैंने कहा अच्छा डज दिस कॉल काउंट इज द फर्स्ट वार्निंग और विल यू डू अनदर वन इज लाइक टेक दिस सीरियसली हाँ तो मैंने कहा ठीक है तो मैंने कहा जब आप दूसरा कॉल करेंगे तो उसमें थ्रेट वही हुआ या कोई उसमें ईजाद करेंगे कुछ नया लाएंगे ठीक है बिकॉज बहुत हो सकते मुझे बताए कि मीन क्या होगा ठीक है ना मैंने कहा ये जो यू नो बाईस बोर्ड की पिस्तौल से तो मेरे ख्याल में मेरा चार भी उसे स्टॉप कर अगर करना है ना तो फोर्टी फाइव मिलीमीटर ये प्रोसेस है अगर तीसरा कॉल में अटेंड ना करूँ तो फिर क्या बड़ी आदमी हो एंड एंड सो अगेन यू नो इट्स जस्ट the absurdity of some of these things it's just the you know this meeting of words because i think that's what's also really interesting in pakistan so mm-hmm. these are things that like i always enjoyed um and 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 again radio in that respect was um one of the most uh, phenomenal things we used to have a kari right a very serious kari एंड वो मुझे याद है मेरा दोस्त है हसन गुली बहुत सीरियस गप हो रही थी उसके साथ लाइक वी बीइंग रिस्पेक्टफुल और दोस्त ने कहा हसन गुली ने कारी साहब को कहा कारी साहब बात सुन बहुत अच्छी बात है मैं अगर आपकी दाढ़ी मुझ लूँ तो आप क्या करेंगे ऐसे क्यों नोचेगा मेरा दाढ़ी मगर नहीं तो इट बिकेम दिस डिस्कशन एंड देन ही फनीस्ट uh people uh, we had met and he would call every so often and he'd call it gladiator battles mm-hmm. he'd, get, he'd go out of the madrasa he'd go to a side and then he'd come to do jukte and and so finding and again i think uh in terms of contradiction and all that one of my favorite things this was a standard question we used to get a lot of security guards calling us and mm. favorite conversations because i had this one joke and they had memorized it and they hated it i said before we start wo jab te rehte honge us joke joke ko ha main se kehta tha wo security guard hote main se kehta tha ke aap mujhe bataye ki pakistani security guard jo hote wo olympics mein kaun sa gold medal le sakte hai sir chode main kaha nahi batao with a long jump main kaha ha theek hai na because anything that was behind the about the door and then we'd have conversations like why would you sacrifice your life for the yes ah and, and especially guys were not giving you food at the you know little thing at the top kabhi salam nahi karte ye wo and and so i i often found that supremely interesting and i think in terms of class one of the things that i used to enjoy most is kabhi na kabhi upper class log would call in thinking they were better than everything else and then you had everything then, and they knew everything and the beauty was that we didn't have to lay, everyone else would lay into them and expose it for being like you know uh, so i don't know i i i've often found like i've said is that i think a lot of great art is you know about contradiction it's about uh some kind of cognitive dissonance and humor 
uh, or satire fundamentally comes out of that as well. Yes, and I and I strongly believe that you know adding humor into whatever in, in your daily conversations or in your communication skills, it sort of allows the other person who may be an introvert who is not comfortable with communicating with you to sort of soften themselves to create a a comfortable situation to have a cushion that you know they won't be judged for something they won't be shut down they won't be silenced and then they're able yeah. to communicate their ideas and sort of like have patience and um sort of like a space where your ideas are being understood and it's really important when you when you're passing criticism on culture like being a cultural critic how do you integrate humor in it like knowing that they're going to have uh, you're going to have different responses from different classes because we have classification uh, in readers in in uh, the audiences jaise aapne bhi bat baat ki maulviyon ki jaise aapne baat ki security guards ki jo aapki people who want to kill you so the different classes of people who don't jinki awareness or jinki education or jinki understanding ya wo ek kisi hasas baat ko samajhne ki unke andar salahiyat itni nahi hoti so how do you integrate humor that sort of is penetrated amongst the entire population whoever is listening to your content or reading your content how do you do that so i think it's two things ek to i mean i would question one thing is because like at least radio taught me this is that your average pakistani however underprivileged is actually incredibly intelligent mm-hmm. and in many ways much more open minded and humane than jo aapka urban upper ya middle class hai mm-hmm. because so the worst things i've heard on radio unse aata tha mm-hmm. and that was even if they disagreed with something they were there was a mode of engagement that was respectful and interesting but i'll give you an example uh yehi jo main kehta hu ki like sometimes like i find that uh, you know friends and people who i respect unke sath jo engagement hoti hai so i at my house there's another one of my friends his name is umar aziz incredibly gifted satirist uh, i mean i think hugely underrated mera dost imran bhi aaya tha there was george fulton and uh, somebody else and then we were sitting and then you know we were just joking around and now a point that you were making is that uh, i actually think that like uh, we are in such a huge um uh, environment of social change and this is brought on by technology it's brought on by tons of other issues uh, social change ke hum bhi like for example jo abhi youth hai 2021 like if you look at the issues they're talking about they seem very removed to concerns that i have right unke jo social justice issues hai mm-hmm. very interesting but usme ek cheez jo aa gayi hai which is कोई ना कोई गलत बात करेगा अपने जिंदगी में their thinking because of that um so i remember at this dinner jab yehi mere sare dost aaye to unme se ek ne kaha ke um and and this is like how sometimes i think like how you know the milieu of the age or evolves itself into humor is i think i let's have a safe space okay let's talk kya cheeze hum nahi mante and so we were all talking ye wo har ek ne apna idea to ek kehta hai yaar main ye transgender cheez nahi manta by the way very humane person very good person but he's like i can't get my head around it why do you change your gender and we mm. try to explain what dysmorphia is and you know how painful it can be theek hai but he was like why mujhe yaad hai mere jo dost imran hai to wo kehta hai use well thank you for your opinion maria c theek hai na and and see it's so you know just the fact that you know it's gotten into the cultural lexicon and there are new ways of describing it to wo keh raha hai yaar ye safe space hai humne kaha nahi nahi like okay, one cheap shot let's say safe space <laughs> yes, that's a flavor theek hai na that's that that is 
वी हैव टू अलाउ वन चीप शॉट पर सेफ स्पेस उसके बाद ठीक है ना हम वो नहीं करेंगे बट इट वॉज ग्रेट एज अ कॉन्वर्सेशन एंड आई थिंक नाउ इन इन सम वेज आई समाइम्स फियर के जो इस्टेब्लिश लोग हैं दे कैन दे कैन एक्चुअली गो थ्रू and this is just about art in general they can go through the vagaries and the kinds of let's say online mobs that can form mm-hmm. because they the younger lot i think there's a huge incentive now to play it safe and i think in some ways that affects creativity because especially once art gets disseminated whether it's humor whether it's how you represent in fine art or anything else like that um because i think fine arts for example one benefit is because it is not so mass oriented you have a much more close circuit space where people can actually express themselves and whatever mere ye hai ke like some of the questions you've been asking is like you've been talking about social change or any impact and that impact comes from mass dissemination or virality or something else like that so usme i mean i found that this particular culture change because it's become really interesting is that technology has enabled you to reach basically unlimited numbers of people but the culture around some of that dissemination has fundamentally changed so you've got the process of digital dissemination with maybe a narrowing of the acceptance of certain kinds of mm-hmm. ideas or art so which brings me to another question do you have a framework to effective goal setting for yourself like you do you do follow something do you follow a rule or a setting or a timeline for performing the best or having an effective result out of what you do so um i think i apologize for that uh, no i think that um yeah i i think that um <clears throat> this one is difficult because um um i have um unfortunately a lot of chaos in my process in my personal life uh bill time pe nahi deta theek hai na i let things pile up then suddenly i have a burst of energy i do a lot of things uh you know i miss flights things like that and um so this particular thing is uh, i think what for me works is not you know putting it in my google calendar it's not noting it down whatever it's always the excitement of what i'm doing that really propels me if it's something that i'm not really interested in right i'll find ways to delay especially and all that but if i'm really, really excited like i can't of anything else and getting it in place uh you know sharing i often wished so i have a very wide number of interests mm-hmm. like i'm really interested i love music uh i love listening to it i, I love speakers I uh I read even gardening magazine you know I never gardened in my life uh I read celebrity gossip and I read anthropology review books um economics um uh, sociology so I read anything I get my hands on and so I used to think that maybe I have some form of ADHD I I would be really happy if I had it so it would explain some of the issues but it, I don't have it um but it's just i i guess ill discipline and habit that's formed that but its benefit is is that it just brings you a lot more perspectives uh you know on things that you uh, put forward um i i mean again i think that you know when you talk about influences i i remember one of my biggest influences i was very young and ptv was airing twin peaks and i'd never seen anything like that in my life and i realized that the censor didn't understand what was going on because mm-hmm. it's a show that has so many taboo subjects 
so many uh, and you know there was only one boy in my class unfortunately uh, he passed away really great guy junaid and he and i used to come he's like what did we just see on tv and at the same time tarantino's pulp fiction came out which inverted everything yes. and again you know we looked at it and we were um, so every form of art that breaks convention in some ways um has been you know hugely um interesting or i think uh, the you know i go back to one thing that you said which really interests me because i think it's part of the narrative of art in pakistan which i think is unfortunate is that art should make you become a better pakistan art should make you do this or do that i just don't think that's true i think art should just make you think yes art should just make you accepting of new representations mm-hmm. and i think the knock on effect of that in society is brilliant because if art is i remember once uh, hosting a panel which was actually on art and new media and i won't take the name but in the pre you know interview stage i was like okay so we talk about the purpose of art and they were like to make a good pakistani a patriotic pakistani one who can stand up to india and i was like no no then no. i asked the other people tigana and ek ne kaha this is all bullshit tigana art is whatever you wanted mai kaha tigana pehle sawal aap se karu and then wo penalty <laughs> right because you know because it's hard to say you know having patriotic citizens is not a bad thing it's a great thing but if that's all you are then sometimes it benefits only the established tiers of institutions who want you to be patriotic in a certain way to the exclusion of other voices in your own community so again i mean i think like in terms of purpose or yeah be like when you look at the situation around joyland they're like ah what does this do for your traditional notions of what it means to be a pakistani and well, that's not the question that should be asked the question should be asked is how many types of pakistanis are there and is it worthy to represent all of the them. most marginalized of them mm-hmm. all of them and, uh, and and so that's why like sometimes like jo purpose ka sawal aata hai na that really sort of gets to me because i love it ke kisi ka purpose ye hai ke this just gave me joy in making it and that is sufficient for me to see it because sometimes you can understand what gave the creator joy so what is the question you wish people asked more from you um so i i i saw that question this one i don't have an answer for i i i think uh, um i mean i guess it would just be a basic hey fussy how are you doing today ha huh, I, i actually that would be great uh anything like that anything that establishes a connection mm-hmm. that i would like uh like you know uh or uh, yeah I, i mean i guess that is because i i also think that um one of the big things that will be and this is maybe outside of art is that we're so hyper connected but we're more lonely than we've ever been and because of polarization yes that your avenues of connection exist but your desire has turned off because you've otherized so many people yes. so i do agree with you that if somebody just says how are you doing or uh, you know tell me about yourself i mean i think these are powerful questions uh, and you know connections are uh, at the heart of everything on that note i'd like to ask the last question which is very very relevant and important for all of us who's listening if i ask you to give three positive affirmations to yourself what would they be yeah so this was the other question that you said that uh i uh, i found difficult to think about and it's um i think uh one thing that i've learned maybe in life is that it does get better there's an overwhelming sense of emotion and you feel that everything is closed off uh and the worst thing is that jo aapke walden ne bhi aapko pata hai unke walden ne unko get time heals uh you know you'll get over it 
Um, I also think that sometimes people feel that they'll remain lonely and unconnected. And actually that can happen for great periods of time. Mm -hmm. However, eventually uh, you can find your own tribe. Uh, it, and it requires some effort on your own self. And the beauty is now you can even do it from your house thanks to these technologies. And the third thing is like, I will get up in the morning at 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. If I could do that, my life would be much, much better. Thank you so much. This meant a lot for us, for those who've been listening, because when I was researching about you, I did not come across many interviews. I don't uh, think that you've given interviews or talks like these, which are on a very personal level, which are sort of very spontaneous and not so rehearsed. And so I've learned so much about you and your process, and I'd love to implement those bits and you know the 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 the, the portion that you just given to us in our creative process. I hope to stay in touch with you, and thank you for all your contribution. And may you do the best all your life, and may you get up at nine a.m. in the morning. Thank you so much. I really thank appreciate you. it. Thank, thank you very honor. much. Thank you so much for all those who've listened and who've been a part of this, patiently listened to both of us, and for taking out time from your busy schedules. This means a lot. Thank you very much.